Hi, I'm Dr. Ali Hushman. Rowan University is committed to educating the public about the importance of higher education in our state and region. That's why we are proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by NJM Insurance Group, the Terrell Fund, a foundation serving children, the New Jersey Education Association, Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. Bartley Healthcare, nursing, rehabilitation, and assisted living. The New Jersey Reentry Corporation. And by New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Promotional support provided by Observer New Jersey Politics. And by Commerce Magazine. Welcome to Caucus. I'm Steve Adubato. We're going to have an important conversation about safety, particularly around our schools. And we're joined in that conversation by James Flynn, who's principal, Burlington City High School, and Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Jessica Lamont, student and battalion commander of the Junior ROTC at Burlington City High School. I want to thank both of you for joining us. Thank you. Um, we've read about, we've heard about a situation, um, Principal Flynn. Um, Jim, this really has to do with, in some ways, Route 130. Tell people where that is and why this is such an important issue that isn't just about Route 130. Well, Steve, uh, Route 130 is one of the deadliest roads in New Jersey for pedestrian safety. Where is it? It is in, in Burlington City. It runs directly in front of Burlington City High School and our intermediate school for grades 3 through 6, Wilbur Watts Intermediate School. We are a walking school district, so our students every day walk to and from school and they have to go over and cross six lanes of this deadliest road in New Jersey. How could that, how could the planners have decided that that was the best way to go? You know, we're a very historic city, a uh, very old city. Uh, southern so New Jersey. Southern New Jersey, Burlington County, we're very proud, caring community. Uh, and years ago, when Burlington City was established, obviously Route 130 was just a little thoroughfare in between. Uh, Everything's you know, changed. Everything's changed. And so what's so uh, powerful about this is there's a movement in the state legislature to deal with this. There's public policy questions or safety questions. Mm -hmm. But Jessica, you got involved in this, yes. along with some other student leaders. Yes. Tell us who Antoine was, why he matters so much in this and what happened and what it has to do with your involvement. Loaded question, I know. Go ahead. So Antoine, he was uh, a, a close friend of mine and a, a lot of other... Uh, a student at the school. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of other students in the school. He was also a cadet of mine and I got very close with him through JRTC. And um, when he was when he was growing up, he didn't we have like... a picture of him right now. We didn't have the best of... Um, like he didn't have the best of life, so he tried to get out of that lifestyle, and he was going to go in the military, and um, he was just going to be, like, one of the superior cadets in he the program. Our country. Yes, he did. What happened and to him? he just wanted to make the best of everything. He, on May 22nd, 2016, he was hit by a moving vehicle crossing the street trying to get some snacks from Wawa in the middle of the night. And Was it on the highway? Yes. He, it the was car, on Route 130. Yes. The car ran off of, high, of the highway and hit him on the sidewalk. What was the reaction in the school when it happened? Uh, Steve, we, we were devastated, uh, in shock. Um, you know, Antoine was Burlington City. He, he uh, attended our schools from kindergarten through high school. Uh, everybody knew Antoine. Uh, as Jessica said, he was, he was really establishing his goals and decided that he wanted to continue with JROTC and serve our country. And when we got the news on that Sunday morning, um, we were devastated. But you, I don't want to say you move forward. That's not the right way to say it. You decided to do something about it and not just grieve for him and his family and your, your friend. What did you do? Um, that upcoming school year, Mr. Flynn and I sat down and said that the, um, 
it was just too dangerous crossing the street because I was still walking. Crossing the highway. Yes, crossing yes. the highway, I'm sorry. And um, I was still walking at the time because I hadn't got my license yet. And I, I surely didn't want to be hit. Of course, like I have my little sister in the school district as well. I didn't want her to be hit as well. And a bunch of my friends cross that street every day. You decided to do something. Yes. yes. To lead an effort. Mm -hmm. And it just started off with a rally like this week last year, just telling motorists just to slow down. Like we're work. looking at some video or pictures of it. Go ahead. So it was a rally, and what happened there? And um, so many students came out. I remember being there that morning and setting up for it and turning around and just like a whole crowd of kids come out and say, I'm, I'm ready to make a change. This is for somebody I'm ready that- to make the change. To, to make, to, to push for change. Yes. So, 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 so what happened? Because where they go, what they do? Steve, we had uh, such, a, such an amazing response uh, out of this tragedy. Our rally um, was terrific. The, the motorists were slowing down. We were simply asking motorists to slow down and be aware that Burlington City High School is literally right here, steps away These from where there's are. These are our kids and they're steps away. And um, what happened, Senator Diane Allen heard our voices, heard the voices Senator of our Diane, students. Diane Allen, who yes. served with distinction in the state legislature, what did she do? She heard about the rally, she heard our voices, and Steve, she called and asked to come to Burlington we're City taking, High School. We were Diane right there, who's a great friend. Yes. Uh, and, and so was there legislation that came out of this? Yes, she, she uh, came to Burlington City High School and proposed three bills, one of which she named Antoine's Law. Antoine's Law, after Antoine's Antoine. Law, after Antoine. And she, that bill was going to establish 25 miles an hour speed limit in front of Burlington City and Wilbur Watts 24 hours a day. And that legislation is where right now? Is it, I dare, I, I'm a former state legislator, so <laughs> using the word stuck, is it stuck in the legislature? So Jessica and a few of our other students helped Senator Allen testify in front of the Senate Transportation Committee and get it out of committee. It is now at the floor. It's uh, on the floor for it, a potential vote? We, we, need, we need to get it to the floor, but it's out of committee. And then Troy Singleton, Assemblyman that Troy Singleton. Terrific legislator. Terrific, from that terrific area. guy from that area, from Palmyra yes. and Burlington. He uh, uh, proposed the bill, and it's through the uh, Senate Transportation, I mean, the Assembly Transportation Committee, thanks to Assemblyman uh, John, John, um, John uh, Wisniewski. Wisniewski. Right. And um, so they're both, the bill is sitting right there after getting out of committee. Okay, but the Department of Transportation has gotten involved too, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. What are they doing? Uh, they came out to the school, talked to mm -hmm. us about, like, what we wanted changed, and then uh, right like middle of our spring break, I was driving down the road, and I noticed that there was two lanes instead of three lanes on one side of the highway, and then the other side of the highway, now there's only four lanes. So they, they did a road diet, that's yeah. what they call it. Is and it they, not as dangerous as it was because of this? I feel as though it's not, because there's nowhere like you can go. Like you have to, you're forced to slow down. Why is this an issue in the time we have left? Jim, let me ask you, why is this an issue for everyone in this state and in the nation right now? Because it's not just your school. No, and Steve, we talk about pedestrian safety and bicycle safety. I think as a result of this tragedy and the awareness and, and thinking about it, we should make a priority student pedestrian safety. Student pedestrian student safety. Around our schools. And everybody can play a part. Motorists can simply slow down in front of our schools. But Legislation. Not by, excuse me for interrupting, but yeah. this should be by law. I mean, people always yes. say well, government shouldn't be involved. Yeah, a lot of things maybe they shouldn't be involved in. This has to be regulated by the law, we, legislated. We feel, for example, that Antoine's law could be life-saving legislation and life-saving law in so New Jersey. Everyone watching right now who may have a comparable situation and, and don't want to wait for a horrible tragedy as to what happened, like what happened with Antoine, what do you say they should do right now, particularly young people like yourself? Um, what they need to do, they need to talk to their principal. They need to say, like, I'm tired of this. I want a change in my town. Be the change. Yes. Be the change. What do you say to uh, school administrators around the state and the other states we're seeing in? Go ahead. School administrators should work with their municipalities and call their local legislators and ask for support for Antoine's law. I think if Antoine's law gets passed, Lives will be saved. Student lives will be saved in New Jersey. So, but it wouldn't be. But you don't want it just at your school. You want it everywhere. For me, I'm, this is my last year. I'm a senior. I want to. I want everybody, like from ninth to twelfth to 
kindergarten to any grade, I want them to be able to cross the highway, cross the street, their town, in their the place they were. That's right. They grew up. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to be safe. Thank you so much. We appreciate Thank it. You, Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more Caucus New Jersey, find us online and follow us on social media. We are honored to be joined by Matthew Melvin, who is uh, executive director of a great organization called Zero to Three, which was started 40 years ago. That's right. Dedicated to? To making sure that every baby has a healthy start in life. Yeah, well, this is part of a, a series that we're doing, a whole comprehensive series of programs um, that examine um, the issues that you're talking about. Our series is uh, this campaign, if you will, is called Right from the Start NJ. Um, and we encourage you to go to our website that you'll see up here, but you also see uh, Zero to Three's site as well. Matthew, one of the issues we've talked about a lot over the phone and, and in meetings getting ready for this is, quote, brain development, if you will, mm -hmm. birth to three. What are we talking about? We've learned a tremendous amount in the last, really, 15 years from neuroscience about the critical importance of the early years of life. And what that science is telling us is that the early relationships and experiences we have as babies and as toddlers literally form the architecture of our brain. And that we know that a million synapses are being formed every second. And we know that some get stronger and some get weaker, really based upon the nature of those kinds of experiences and interactions we have with the adults in our lives. And that, in turn, lays the foundation for who we become as adults. It's like building a house. Mm. Uh, if we have a weak foundation, we're going to be able to make repairs later on, but it's going to cost a lot more and cause a lot more challenges. But if we get things right at the start, we have a very, very strong foundation upon which to build. From a public policy point of view, is this a public policy question of infants, toddlers, zero to three? I mean, is this a public policy question? Absolutely so? no question. Because, and people don't naturally make that link. They're like, yeah, but, we'll take care of your kid. No, that's right, not, it's right. that simple. But if you really look at what the science is telling us, where we need to be investing in terms of providing support and, and education for parents is really in the earliest months and years of life. Because that does lay the foundation. And what we find is that when you have a baby in the United States, it's sort of a little bit like the Wild West. You're there on your own. There's no real, real support for you. Try to get childcare, for example, for an infant. It's prohibitively expensive. That's right. At least quality care. And that's coming at a time of life when, you know, people are forming families. They don't have the kind of money they have. They're telling you to start to save for college. But in reality, return on investment is much stronger in terms of what we do in the early years of life. We've got a Nobel laureate at the University of Chicago, which is not a hotbed of liberalism, that basically has shown and demonstrated that if you make investments early in life in mm. terms of good quality child care, in terms of things like paid family leave, paid family leave. You make sure that families have time to be able to bond with their babies, those will have big payoffs for not just those babies as they grew, grow, but for society overall. So, so one of the things that's interesting, I mean, you have this national perspective, and, you, and you're clearly one of the most respected people in the nation on this issue, and your organization has been leading the effort. But for those of us in New Jersey, there's going to be there's a new governor in 2018, new legislature. There's an opportunity to do some things in this state. And again, I know you're you deal in 50 states. Mm -hmm. But what could and should we be doing? Well, clearly, first, take a step back. We are at really at a critical tipping point. We are seeing across the United States that the science is finally catching up with awareness on the part of policymakers and even on part of parents. Parents right. really understand why these years are important. And they're looking to their elected officials for support in different ways. So New Jersey, as an example, can and should be putting more resources into providing public subsidies that support parents' abilities to purchase childcare. You can do that through direct subsidies. You can do that through the tax system. But you need to recognize that parents need quality. You need to bring up the training of that workforce. Right now, the workforce has and very the little... the childcare right. industry, if you will. Very, very little requirement in terms of what, you, uh, what they get. And there needs to be a lot more to support them. And they're paid poorly. 
child care providers tend to be paid worse than parking lot attendants. Although our babies and our children were our most precious resource. Well, resource. That's, we, we talk about that. Easy Politicians talk. love to kiss babies, right. but How not about? when it comes to doing it. I mean, they just don't make that happen. Hey, and paid family leave is another, another hey, piece of that. Explain to people. What, what does that mean? Explain to me. Everyone hears the expression paid family leave. Does it, it mean like, okay, you take the time to care for your child for a certain period of time, Paid family leave. Go ahead. The United States is the only industrialized country in the world that does not have a national paid family leave policy, which essentially so says... So it's a state by state, you say? It is state by state. Right. And New Jersey actually has a provision in its unemployment insurance code that allows for that to happen, but it's not widely used and it needs to be built upon. Um, but essentially what it means is that when you have a baby, you should get some form of... Uh, economic subsidy from your either from your employer and or from the state that mm -hmm. allows you to spend those critical weeks and in many cases right. months to bond with your baby that's what the baby needs that's right. the baby's programmed to want to spend time with you to be able to interact with you and we're like and when, hey get back to work yeah and when they don't <laughs> get it you know that has a really severe impact on who they, how they the understand foundation. the world. Yes, uh, there's an initiative that I want you to talk about: the Still Face Experiment. What is it? Well, I, I hope you'll be able to show it. But essentially, what this is is Some that video. But go ahead. Yep, you you ask uh, a parent, usually a mom, to put their baby, it could be one year old, uh, and and you face the baby and you look at the baby and the baby's looking at you. And in a healthy relationship, the baby and the mom are going back and forth and doing this incredible serve and return. Uh, that is what you expect to see. And then we ask the mom to turn around, face the baby, and have a completely flat affect, as if she's depressed. And what you'll see in a very short period of time, usually minutes, is that the baby at first will do everything the baby can do to bring mom back, to engage with mom, babble, point, you try to really get mom engaged. And when mom doesn't engage, then the baby starts to literally lose control. Mm. They look away, they have gaze aversion, and at, at some point they'll just start to break down completely. And if you ask mom to come back, they'll be right back wow. there again. But if you're eight months of age and you have a mom or dad and they're clinically depressed or not available, you're living in a, in a really chaotic environment, that baby at eight months of age, when this incredible amount of brain development is going on and self-identity is happening, Absolutely. is essentially getting the message, no one cares about me. I'm not important. Um, no one's talking to me. I'm not learning words. I'm not, I'm not engaging in the way that I'm supposed to engage. And that really creates a very weak foundation in terms of brain development and in terms of where we go wow. as, as adults. Matthew Melmet is the executive director of an extraordinary organization, 40 years in, blazing a trail, if you will, called Zero to Three. I thank you for advising us uh, on our initiative called Right from the Start NJ. Um, thank you, Matthew. It's we'll be right pleasure. back thank right you. after this. To watch more Caucus New Jersey, find us online and follow us on social media. Jennifer Velez is Senior Vice President of Community and Behavioral Health at RWJ Barnabas Health. Jen, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, separate, or you know what, clarify behavioral health, and then we'll talk about community health together. Behavioral health is um, someone's state of well-being. Is it mental right? health? It's mental health. It's substance use disorder. It's everything that involves the brain and emotion. Um, but it's a disease. So mental illness is a disease. Substance use disorder is a disease. It's a disease like cancer, like diabetes, and we should treat it no differently than those. You know, we were at a forum. I was hosting a forum, and you were in the audience, but a key player in the audience with the Mental Health Association of New Jersey. I and I remember we did this. You said a disease just like cancer, just like some other terrible disease. To what degree do you believe the stigma still exists? Like, no, it's not. It's not really that. I think that um, stigma is probably one of the most pressing issues we have for people to access care as freely as they really need to. I think I mean, that they need it. They absolutely need it. And actually, what you talked about, the forum that I last, uh, we last uh, were together, um, that was such a beautiful forum because people were talking freely, openly about I have mental illness, I suffer from whether it's simply depression and anxiety or I have something much more serious like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. 
So once we begin to treat that as the disease it is, or some combination, we'll really begin to get to somebody's whole health. A good example might be um, if you have a cardiac issue, you've had a heart attack, you've had cancer recently, there, there's a chance, a really um, significant chance that you will also suffer from some depression that follows. Connected to it? Connected but to we'll it. But we'll deal with the cancer. You'll get that treated. You'll, you'll get the get heart. That. And you'll but leave maybe not having your, your behavioral health, your mental illness, even uh, assessed to see whether or not you're having any feelings of depression or anxiety. It is a spectrum. It is from one end of, uh, you know, from one end of the spectrum to another. And I think we're comfortable talking about some aspects of it. But depression is more than simple sadness and bipolar and schizophrenia is on the opposite end of the spectrum, and that seems very scary. But it's so, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, Jen. I'm thinking about this. Uh, I, I, I disclose what I think I need to disclose, or it's appropriate. But Jen and I have had offline conversations, frankly, about family members, and I've reached out for help um, and advice. I've often wondered, you know, like I'm like I, I've talked to at times, like I don't want the family member I'm talking about to know, and all that secrecy. You see that a lot. Is prohibiting people from reaching out for help. It's not a Like, why am I hiding it? Why are you hiding it? When we have celebrities, I guess, um, as probably a good example, say, I suffer from depression, I suffer from anxiety, or my kid does, or my mother does, it, it releases, and everyone, everyone sort of exhales a bit to say, I do too. No. And I really believe there's a degree or two of separation among each of us to say, it is my neighbor, it is my mother, it is my daughter um, that also suffers from this too. So there's no hiding it. The more that we can really elevate mental illness and substance use disorder, which, you know, as we you can't you know lose a day without picking up the newspaper hearing some story about right. the um, you know the, the tragedies uh, the tragedy to and the epidemic that this has become. Um, so we really do need to talk about this and to begin to treat it appropriately because unless we do, mm. we won't we won't dedicate the resources to treating it appropriately. By the way, you're seeing the website up for RWJ Barnabas Health. Reach out, get some more information. Real quick on this, the community health piece. Give us one example of what that means. Oh, community health is. Um, it's everything that's not acute care, right? So you go to the hospital and you get treated, and I would say in our system, you get treated by the best, right? When you are discharged and you're back to your community, your care for yourself or your family member continues. Mm. So what is, and, and particularly with vulnerable communities, which is primarily an area of my focus, so what are those other factors in your life that will ensure that you have a successful health care outcome? So that is, you know, all of the determinants that you hear about. And interesting, I think, that in someone's sort of circle of their whole life, about 30% is really the me their medical issues. 70% really, you can give or take, is really everything else their in their life, around. their oh, environment. Give me 30 more seconds here if we could, team, uh, extra. So it's around them, their health issues. People say crime. It's not a health issue, but it is. It is. It's, crime is a health issue. Um, it's whether, you know, you're, it, the environment in which you live, if you have, I mean, you hear this around whether you have mold in your apartment or you have, you know... Asbestos, asbestos or lead. All of or those um, environmental factors that are going to begin to also interact with your, your ability to be healthy, whether you have asthma or, you know, CF, COPD. So they were always sort of talked about these factors as sort of extraneous from your health. But what we know is in order to keep you healthy, you can keep coming back to the hospital, we'll right. keep treating you. Symptoms. And, symptoms. But in order to keep you healthy, these are the things you really have to address. So that's the community side. So what are those factors that are going to influence you to have a successful and healthy life? Transportation, your job, crime in your neighborhood, your ability to access healthy food. So they're more than just sort of factors that someone else thinks about. We need to think about that and act upon them. Let me ask you this. The opioid crisis in New Jersey, how bad is it and what do we need to do? It's uh, destroying individuals and families, right? But the drug crisis in New Jersey, and I would you know, dare say nationwide, has been destroying individuals and families for a long, long time. I do think that uh, demographically, uh, the crisis has been hitting uh, suburban areas um, in more, more rapid succession. The numbers have really grown incrementally, uh, significantly over the past set of years. And I think resources are now allocated to really address the crisis, to address the epidemic. But I, I think it's fair to say that the drug epidemic has been in urban neighborhoods for a long, long time. Do you think that's not a coincidence, Jen? Um, that I there's don't more focus than ever before on this? I don't think it's a 
coincidence. I think it's it's a it's um it's a little unfortunate, but the silver lining of all of this is that if we have resources available now, they're available to everybody, and that's how we're addressing it. And in our system, I think one of the best things that we're doing at our WJ Barnabas at our Health. WJ Barnabas Health is we have peer recovery specialists in each of our facilities, and actually in a couple of others that aren't our facilities as well, based upon you know how we applied for some grants when they first came out. So we're really helping our own hospitals as well as some hospitals outside of our system. But we're helping them with people who are peers. So when a parent, when a doctor, when a nurse says to you, I can get you help, you right. need to get help, you can't do this anymore. If I'm somebody who's a substance use disorder, and this has been in my life forever, I say, get out of my face. When I'm a peer, I say to you, I've been in your shoes, and, and I'll stay with you. And that has made the difference. In greater than 50% mm -hmm. of the time, we're able to engage with the person at the bedside coming in after having nearly died, reversed by Narcan, brought into the emergency department. And for the medical professionals in those emergency departments, they've been a godsend because, you know, medical professionals want to help. Docs, right. nurses, they all want to help. And nothing has really been able to get through as effectively as a peer, as a peer someone who's been in their shoes. And that's what's happening at RWJ Barnabas Health on a regular basis. And you and your colleagues are doing it. And to disclose, your organization has been a big uh, supporter of public broadcasting. And the CEO, Barry Ostrowski, serves on the board, if yeah. you will, of public broadcasting. Great Jen. leader. Great visionary. Uh, Jen, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, it's one thing to have great offline conversations with you, but also to talk to you right here and you helping a lot of other people makes a difference. Thanks so much. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by NJM Insurance Group, the Terrell Fund, the New Jersey Education Association, Rowan University, Bartley Healthcare, the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. The New Jersey Reentry Corporation is dedicated to helping those returning from prison to have a second chance. Providing addiction treatment, housing, legal services, and health care goes a long way to helping people achieve healthy sobriety and to secure a job. For a person to remain independent, self-sufficient, and healthy, a job is a necessity. We're in the business of transforming lives because we believe that everyone deserves a second chance.